All right, so hello everyone. Good evening uh, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world, because we have many friends joining us online as well. Uh, my name is Leanne, and I'm with the People's Forum, and I see a lot of uh, old friends, but also a lot of new faces. So I wanted to just first say, welcome to the People's Forum. <laughs> we are a political education and cultural space, and we are so excited to be hosting this uh, incredible seminar on the untold successes of the German Dem Democratic Republic, a history that is often overlooked, and it shouldn't be, because it's one of the most exciting and interesting examples of a socialist project that we have in our recent history. Um, and so I'm not going to give a, a long introduction, because we have some amazing educators with us today that I really qu quickly want to get uh, the mic over to them. Uh, but first, just a point of uh, process. Uh, for all those who are joining in person, uh, when it comes time to make interventions and, and questions, just raise your hand and we'll bring a mic to you so that we can make sure everyone online can also hear you. And those who are online, you can use the raise hand function and we'll do our best to get every, every, all the participation virtually and physically uh, as possible. So uh, I'm going to welcome two amazing comrades who have come all the way from Berlin to uh, lead us in this uh, study session. Francisca and Max, who are going to introduce themselves uh, and come on up. Um, hello, everybody. You can hear me all right? Yeah, cool. Um, thank you very much to the People's Forum for inviting us. I think that's pretty cool. Thank you. And welcome everyone here. Um, uh, maybe one word to the song. You said I should say something about the song, mm -hmm. so I will. Uh, some of you might have recognized it. It's based on uh, which side are you on. It was October Club singing. Uh, October Club is one of the bands from the GDR that was introduced into like what they call Hootenanny, so basically folk music, and was very influential. And there's a lot of sort of working class songs that they themselves wrote, but also interpreted international songs. Um, so that just for the song. Mm. <laughs> thank you, thank you, that was easy. Um, so we're here to talk about a very small country in Central Europe. If you think, first detour, if you think this map looks a little distorted, it is because it is a Hobo Dyer projection. Hobo Dyer projections are equal area projections, and they actually show a little bit more realistically how big or small countries really are, while the maps that we are usually used to, Mercator maps, they emphasize or enlarge the global north uh, more than the global south. So therefore, the country was not only small, it was smaller than you usually uh, think. So there was about 16 million people living in that country. That is less than the New York City metro area and existed only for 40 years. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's probably, I don't know, probably less than the lifespan of a club. Uh, here we see it again. Um, the wall that existed for 28 years, basically separated, also that separated Berlin, uh, basically is the synonym for the Cold War and uh, the battle of the free world against German, uh, against, sorry, against communist dictatorships of the Eastern Bloc. Um, it is basically, it is often known for imprisoning its people. It is being, is known as being governed by really old and really old men it is, um, it is known for its long lineups for the consumer goods. There it actually says it's bananas. That's uh, an ongoing thing. Smelly, very smelly cars made of cardboard. Mass surveillance. Awkward shows of military strength. Nudity. And it was all black and white. So I guess we really have to explain why we are even here talking about this and bringing this up at all. Um, Max and Francisca, we said this already. Um, we're from Berlin. We're working for a small research center called the EFDDR, Internationale Forschungsstelle DDR, International Research Center, GDR, GDR, AKA East Germany. We'll be referring to East Germany in this presentation just to sort of make it more roll of the tongue than GDR. Um, my personal background is in social sciences. I uh, came to the topic of the GDR kind of naturally. I grew up in it, at least a little bit. Um, and then it became obvious that when in school, when being asked by people, often international comrades, when uh, my own children went to school, that the kind of 
questions that were asked and the kind of answers that were given and even the answers that I could give were very unsatisfying. They were very much not, uh, they didn't get, often get to the heart of the matter and they very much clouded and sort of obfuscated some type of agenda, <coughs> sometimes more or less hidden, um, of sort of legitimizing a capitalist system that had, you know, won actually already. So why, uh, yeah, why give us oversimplified, under complex answers to questions that we were raising? So for me, the work at the EFDDR um, is sort of a respectful and useful way to evaluate what actually happened, what was, what took place in those 40 years, what was, what happened to this model of uh, this alternative model to a capitalist society and uh, that was sort of realized and existed for a while in the 20th century and I guess there is some, um, some way one could argue that Cuba also still is resisting uh, the, yeah, the capitalist uh, system. And we want to draw from these insights uh, possible answers for our current conundrums and for our current political struggles and also for perhaps future projects. So, um, yeah, I consider the work at the EFDDR to be part of the battle of ideas and of our specific battle, which is to reclaim socialism. I would give it over to you. Okay, uh, I'll just uh, shortly also introduce myself uh, so that I'm not silently just sitting on the stage. Um, uh, I'm Max, as I've already been introduced. Uh, I've been working with the Research Center for about three years now, and uh, I've just finished uh, studies on agricultural development uh, in the GDR, and I'm, of course, involved in all the different fields that we're doing. Um, I've uh, been active and interested in overcoming capitalist conditions for, well, my entire conscious life, I, I can say. And this path uh, brought me uh, also with increasing interest uh, towards uh, the German Democratic Republic, the GDR, as an actual attempt to build up an alternative societal system. Um, like personally, I've uh, studied media and film, which I um, fortunately can also put to good to put to good use uh, to contribute to our uh, filmed interview archive that we maybe also can show you later on our website. My English is not uh, perfect. I, I ask you to be kindly forgiving <coughs> if I might lack some uh, words, but I think we'll get along. So um, I want to introduce uh, all of you uh, to our agenda that we've planned. Um, um, but before that, uh, maybe just uh, a little more words to our uh, research uh, center, <coughs> which is uh, a small research center uh, with uh, limited capacities. Um, this is due to that there's not much room, uh, especially in Germany, for research countering the hegemonic uh, narrative on the GDR. Thus, we are very lucky to have uh, at least a little space for this. Um, and um, besides our studies, of which we brought several copies of our uh, first issue uh, that we also gave as reading material in preparation to this uh, seminar, We'll leave it here so you can get it at the People's Forum. I guess it's uh, also all online. We've also just published an English version of uh, Socialist Health, the healthcare system uh, on the GDR. And uh, online we do have an interview archive where we preserve uh, direct knowledge and experiences of the GDR, uh, of GDR citizens in different fields. Also with English subtitles, at least some of them. And um, another series that we will um, um, be launched shortly uh, that we call Friendship, uh, in German it's Freundschaft, uh, which was an important uh, claim also uh, for the youth organization, um, where we put uh, also as an archive, archive put together documents and texts um, on internationalism and solidarity, and we try to examine the anti-imperialist strategy that what was put into practice in the GDR, uh, and also the general approach on proletarian internationalism, but uh, we will also get into that a little later in our seminar. Um, so what we have prepared, we have prepared kind of four modules, so to say. Uh, the first one that we will go into today is uh, the GDR's path to socialism. Uh, we talk about the socialist economy and socialist democracy tomorrow and also on proletarian internationalism. 
For each module, we have a short presentation that we want to go through and a space for Q&A and discussions. Uh, we suggest, however, to open up for a broader discussion in the end of the workshop today and tomorrow so that we are able to include all the content together and not get lost in expert debates on details, which can easily happen, I guess. Okay, so uh, a little more on uh, what we're going to do today. We'll focus on the question how the GDR actually came into existence, what, were, what was its path to socialism, what were the circumstances that influenced the ground on which this society developed. It is important to keep this condition, these conditions in mind because we will again and again uh, come across them in our other modules. And uh, as an optional choice, depends on how long you want to stay, we might uh, also watch uh, a short moody movie of 30 minutes uh, um, after like our official end, but uh, just as you like it. <laughs> That's up to you. Okay, so tomorrow, uh, um, we hope that at least some of you will make it also tomorrow uh, to the second part of the session. If not, uh, it's all online, I guess, on the uh, uh, website of the People's Forum, so uh, you can also re-watch the session. Uh, but it uh, adds up to a comprehensive understanding of the GDR. Uh, so tomorrow we'll uh, uh, give an introduction of the economic system of the GDR. We'll talk about the way the planning system worked, about the development of the state ownership, and what it meant as a change for the society. We'll talk about the role that enterprises played in the lives of the people. We'll talk about unions and shortly also on wages and the price system. Uh, afterwards, we want to dive into the political and democratic system of the GDR, with, uh, which we hopefully confidently can counter the overall picture of an authoritarian uh, and unfree, etc. state. Uh, we talk about different structures and units uh, that played a role um, for the democratic debates and decision-making processes and give examples for the GDR's approach of a democratic culture. And uh, we will end with a module on internationalism, as I said, where we want to look concrete, uh, at concrete examples of solidarity and discuss the question in what way this international work and relations of uh, the GDR towards all uh, kinds of states differed from what we can see from capitalist uh, countries today and is known as US aid or development aid or whatever. <laughs> uh, we also want to understand the general strategic approach that the GDR developed together with the socialist camp to fight the struggles against imperialism in uh, unity worldwide. And uh, we will end uh, in the end have time to bring it all together in a general discussion, as I said, uh, where we should debate uh, as we think on how and why all of this is relevant to us uh, uh, and the struggles that we face uh, uh, now. Okay, so I hope I gave you a, a good introduction to our agenda and uh, motivated you to also come to the seminar tomorrow. Um, and I'll give it back to you, I guess. Cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> before we, before we, oh, microphone is on, yeah? I can't hear myself properly. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, before we go into the preparing the ground for socialism presentation, um, I would like for us to, I would like for all of you to actually help us contribute to our work, contribute to our thought process by actually talking about these questions uh, that we have posted here. What did you hear or learn? What did you ever read about the GDR? Obviously, we are not like asking you to list, you know, not, not everything, just, um, and what would you like to know? So what are the things that you feel uh, are particularly, yeah, hidden? So we'd like to, we'd like to invite you maybe for a few uh, contributions, uh, if you are, yeah, if you feel comfortable talking. Keep it brief so that everybody gets a chance. Layan is with the microphone. One second, please. So hello, my name is Leo. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm very excited to hear more about this. And uh, what I hear, especially about the solidarity that the GDR had with Chile and Latin America, especially with the concerts and the youth concerts uh, and, and the new Chilean songs. So I'm just wondering how was the cultural work and especially the solidarity with Latin America through the dictatorships and the socialist uh, movement. Cool. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much for being here. Um, I guess I was very happy to see this advertised because um, it was the last thing on my mind, GDR. Um, but 
it seems like um, we should know more about it. Uh, I think the most of my impression, uh, some years ago there was a movie, Other People's Lives. The Lives of the Others? Yes, something like that. And uh, it was not a, a complimentary picture. No. <laughs> um, but uh, knowing, as I do, that we uh, have a problem in this country, or maybe uh, around much of the world, accessing what you might call the truth. Uh, so I want to just learn more and, and uh, more accurately what, what was. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, when I think of East Germany, um, oh, I've, I've watched several documentaries on it, and what was most striking to me in them was the attempt of building a sort of new proletarian culture, a cult, like a, a newer, because um, there was a cultural, sorry about that. Um, there was like a sort of cultural synthesis going on, um, and I think of like Sandman, like the TV show Sandman, and, and Ernst Busch, and a lot of these cultural um, figures, and um, I think a lot of that gets, Oh, well, I, I think a lot of the gates are overshadowed <laughs> shadowed by the Berlin Wall, though. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you for being here. Um, so what I've learned about the GDR is like basically like how, how awful it was to live there, and like um, the Berlin Wall, and like how like how hard it was like to like go into like the west side of Germany, like how, how restricted travel was, and like um, and like. Years ago, I watched a movie called *The Man from Uncle*, and like it briefly featured like the GDR and like had a plotline like um, getting out of the GDR. And um, what I would like to learn about the GDR is um, like what was education like there, like mm -hmm. for like minors and like and adults and like um. Uh, let me see. Uh, mm -hmm. Was was like was travel there really as restricted as like they make it seem? Like was it really that hard to go to like capitalist countries or no? Thank you for the question. I'll take one more from here, and yeah. then I'll read you a few things that came on the Zoom ah, okay, chat. Cool. Uh, guten Abend. Uh, hello. <laughs> so, um, you know, I started learning German in high school, and then my teacher, fantastic German teacher, but she would show us black and white these really great pictures and see, look how bad it looked, you know, before 1989. The Brandenburg Gate is all pure gray. And uh, there were never been any bananas. They kept focusing on bananas for some reason. You know, over time, uh, learning, you know, Marxism and just more history, I realized this is not really a full picture. Um, and I understand there were certain advances, and I would love to learn particularly the advances in terms of the workplace mm -hmm. and, um, you know, how, how the workplace functions. But, um, yeah. Cool. Uh, Hello. Um, there was a movie that came out a few years ago with Tom Hanks. Uh, it was about, I can't remember the name, but it was about uh, Bridge of Spies, yes. Thank you, guys. Um, but it was about the, the, the U-2 pilot who got shot down uh, over Russia, I believe, over the Soviet Union. And then uh, Tom Hanks' character, he was in charge of uh, uh, trading uh, our pilot for a prisoner that we had. Uh, and it took place a lot in Germany, East Germany, East Germany and West Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just very interesting to see that. They didn't dive too much into it uh, or into the life in East Germany, but it did give some type of uh, basis for at least what happened from our point of view, I guess. Cool. And there's also a few great comments on the Zoom chat. I won't read them all, but... Um uh, just a few. There's uh, f folks have been reading Victor Grossman's book Socialist Defector. Uh, there's people who've seen quite a few different films. Um, there's researchers of the GDR. There's people who grew up seeing TV commercials where they were selling pieces of the Berlin Wall. Wall. Wow. Um, so quite a wide uh, variety of uh, insights. Amazing. Um, yeah, thank you. I think we will probably like we'll have more chances. Thank you so much for those contributions and those questions. We will address quite a few of them, like according to the modules that we have laid out. Some of it fits nicely into it. Um, I realized that 
in terms of culture, we are actually not so well prepared. We will see some of it in the uh, in the internationalism presentation. So we have illustrations and stuff like that, but we are not seeing, we are not talking much about how culture was, um, what what culture meant uh, and how it was produced. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe just as an as an impression, because I think it's actually quite usual, or quite quite common that. Uh, Things that pop up when people talk about what do they know about the GDR, it's like, it's it's details, you know, it's it's like it's uh, it's some specifics, people people know. It's, it's it's actually pretty much the same in Germany as well. It's not it's not like uh, yeah. the German people do know uh, lots of things uh, about the society, how it works, how it developed, how it came into being, and so on, and um I would say that uh, it's it's for a reason that we do not get presented a comprehensive understanding of this society, but actually just just some specifics that really do not uh, are not able to explain, uh, um, yeah, or uh, yeah, make us understand of uh, a possible alternative that the GDR actually uh, presented. Cool. Yeah, it's not it's not well sorted. Uh. Okay, but we will keep those things and we will bring them back in the discussion. Thank you for that. I think that's very good. Um, I also think that we have to address one more issue. Talking about the GDR in and of itself is um, perhaps interesting, but the essence of what we want to get to is actually uh, socialism. So we want to talk about, and why do we want to talk about socialism? What's the point of that? Like, that's what we need to get to, because everything else would just be a you know, like a colorful fish in an aquarium that's not relevant if you don't look at the full picture or the environment of all this. So obviously the first reason is pretty straightforward. Some people have mentioned it already. Um, capitalism as we see it right now is totally unable to solve any of our most fundamental problems. Like whether we're talking about the financial crisis or I don't know, unemployment, racism, sexism, war, social ills of all kinds, from like illiteracy to a lack of health care, like none of this has been solved. And that all of that, despite the fact that, well, apparently 30 years ago, the free world won and had it all chances. Let's like a few socialist examples, small examples uh, we still have, but they basically had free range for the last 30 years and we are no better off. And in fact, many people would argue this is we are now in a way worse position. So we need to talk about, we need to tackle out the essence of what, uh, what, what did socialism do differently? And is it actually still a possible alternative? And we need to see um, that we, yeah, that this essence is drawn out and that we allow ourselves to talk about those things with confidence. Um, another reason, which is maybe a bit of a side issue, but which, again, obviously brought some of you here, is, of course, there is a bit of a stubborn resistance, people who like to point out that many of the, many of the social ad, um, advances that the GDR actually accomplished, like universal free health care. I know that the TPF did a funky video on uh, rent payments and what rent meant in uh, what rent meant in the GDR, which was ridiculously low and was actually subsidized because having a roof over your head is not a profit oriented process, but it's um, it's a right or um, that there was actually no unemployment, that there was affordable child care from crash to kindergarten, free public education, higher uh, education. And the list goes on. And the interesting thing about it is many of those things are things that our movement struggle for today. Like, I don't know, right for housing? That's like, I don't know, it's a common thing. Or I know that, of course, here in the, uh, in the US just recently with the dialing back of the right to abortion, like these are things that not only did they exist in East Germany, they were enshrined in law. They were not like a coincidence, like a get around of some law the way that I read about this a little bit. I wasn't aware of it. Like it was not a get around some law or some privacy issue. It was enshrined in law that women have the right to choose. So these types of social achievements, um, we also need to look at those. And looking at those means that something went okay. And we need to find out whether this happened because of the structure of the state, of the economic and political structure, 
of the GDR or whether it happened despite these constructions. And for us, that I think is key to why we need to talk about this. But then, yeah. Yeah. Um, we want to make clear, of course, though, that the GDR was not a, a paradise or something, but uh, in general, it's not a good idea to think about socialism in a way of a paradise. Uh, and um, the scale to measure and evaluate the development of socialist countries is not just an abstract idea, but it's concrete realities and circumstances so that we can actually understand the specifics in its strike to overcome uh, to capital uh, uh, overcome capitalism this is kind of the method or mindset that we want to also um, uh, yeah get across um, from our point of view uh, it's very important to understand the GDR and to embrace it as our history then our examination becomes productive uh, it's not foreign to us what the GDR did and stood for, irrespective of where you come from. Also from the US, it's not only like for us in Germany, it was people like us who tried to overcome fascism, war, poverty, hunger, etc., etc., and build up this society. Who are we to bring us in a distanced relation towards them? Before actually and really have looked and understood their struggle, problems, and contradictions. So, um, how are we going to establish a powerful and relatable perspective of the current and ongoing struggles and, develop, uh, and development of the world without understanding and building on the actual experiences in this field? I see, and I want to stress this, uh, the distance that often lays between the progressive struggles today and the socialist experience of the 20th century as a huge problem. Even on concrete terms, we are able to connect struggles and demands in all kinds of fields, like healthcare, housing, workers' rights, as Francisco already said, with the achievements and efforts of the socialist countries. But more generally, they stand for something that we should not easily let the elites of today take from us. Yeah. With that being said, we formulated a small goal <laughs> for our next for our next two day sessions. Um, I just want to add oh. one more thing. Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm a little close to my script. That's also because I'm nervous, but I hope you forgive me that I'm not always in uh, eyesight with you. <laughs> uh, but I think I, I'll be able to bring uh, over my points uh, uh, properly. So um, I just want to add that we are in a difficult position uh, as the ones um, involved in progressive struggles today because we must know very much. The enemies of socialism and the GDR do not need to know a lot. It's enough to say Stasi, which is Staatssicherheit, state police, or the wall, or scarcity. And it is enough because it is not a contradic contradiction to the hegemonic narrative on the history of socialism. It's not being questioned by the broad public or persons of authority or academia. But if we oppose this picture, we need to be armed with all the knowledge and arguments to withstand at least it seems that way. And it is, of course, very useful and important to know all this concrete history. That's why we're here. Although I, although I would say that we do also not need to take every bait. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So with that, we come to our small goal for the next two days to sort of get some of that knowledge uh, across. Um, with that, I want to say two short disclaimers. Number one, we are talking about the GDR because we know the GDR best. Experiences cannot be transplanted and translated one to one into another context. That's clear. And we will talk about the very specific context of the GDR in just a moment. At the same time, it is just as silly to assume that the GDR was such a crazy special place that some of the principles reigning there are not transferable. So this is our sort of conundrum. On the one hand, being precise on the historic circumstances of the GDR, but on the other hand, also extracting the general, um, the more general essence of it. Uh, and the second disclaimer is, I don't know whether this will be necessary, but of course, um, inevitably, 
we will get to the point or we will talk about, so if it was great or if you are presenting something that worked so well, why didn't it? How did it end? What, what happened? What went wrong? Um, we will in our presentations talk about contradictions and problems. We will not focus on them. Um, and I think there's two reasons, or we thought that there's two reasons for this. We feel that we need to know how a machine works before we can address why it suddenly broke down, or not suddenly, maybe slowly. Like we need to, we want to focus on understanding what was happening there and not want to focus from the end of it, like from there is something broken in front of you. Obviously, it is fundamentally flawed. This is it. So we will not be focusing so much on this, but we are, of course, open for all sorts of, uh, all sorts of questions and debates around this. And then the second part is, yeah, to some extent, we also feel that this is what everyone else is already doing, focusing on what was bad about it. So I'm sure there's enough, there's enough literature and movies and stuff uh, around that. All right. What happens next? Ah, okay. So this is where we're at right now. We talked about all this, so we can go into the um, we can go into the presentation on the historic conditions that existed um, and how the GDR came came to talk about or came to came to be set on the on the socialist path. Is everyone doing okay? Do we need like a we, everyone is doing fine. Nobody needs a two-minute break or something. Everything is cool. All right. Nice. Um, then let's see. Preparing the ground for socialism. Let's set the stage. Europe in, and Germany in 1945. Um, on May 8th, 1945, the Second World War ended in Europe. We know that it did not end everywhere in Asia, especially, for example, uh, the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th, respectively. So there are still crimes to come. However, we stay in Europe for the moment. And there the war ends on May 8th or May 9th um, with the unconditional capitulation of Germany. Um, this picture, this image may be familiar to some of you. The anti-Hitler coalition assumes sovereignty over the German Reich according to agreements made in Crimea earlier that year, and then in the Potsdam Agreement of 1945, Germany is divided into four occupation zones, Berlin also, so you can see uh, the British, the French, the Americans, and the Soviet Union. Um, the anti-Hitler coalition is not a coalition of like aligned states and friends. It's actually a very, very volatile thing and uh, the Western states are actually quite willing to allow Nazi Germany and communist Russia to destroy each other for as long as possible and then enter the war when there's a real threat that the Soviet, that the Red Army will actually march all across Europe. Um, so this, in fact, some people argue that this is even part of the uh, strategy of the destruction by the Allied forces in some places such as Dresden, the bombing of Dresden, in February 45, which from a military standpoint didn't make much sense anymore, but to, in order to sort of combat the communist threat and leave nothing behind for the Red Army that was approaching quickly um, so that the communist threat as a concept is already long in existence at this point. This is not something that only happened after. Um, World War II cost the Soviet Union about 27 million lives. I know there is issues around this, like some historians say it's been many more people, uh, up to 35 million. And the Soviet Union also sort of bore the brunt of the war in terms of the scorched earth, earth uh, strategy employed by the Wehrmacht, which left, I don't know, 70,000 villages, 32,000 industrial facilities completely razed to the ground in the area. Um, for, the for the negotiations of the Potsdam Agreement in August 45, this anti-Hitler coalition comes together on seemingly friendly and agreeable terms. Uh, we have Churchill for the UK, uh, Truman for the US, Stalin for the Soviet Union. There is some shifts uh, in personnel over the, over the renegotiations, but let's stick with those three. Um, the, oh, here. Um, and they come up with 
a number of agreements which are colloquially known as the four Ds. Denazification, punishing war criminals, removing high-ranking Nazis from relevant positions in the justice system, police, army, politics, etc. Demilitarization, disarm and destroy and dismantle the German arms industry. Decentralization, crush the concentrate, which means to crush the concentrated power of the many monopolistic businesses in Germany. And democratization, which seeks to restructure public life. The Potsdam Agreement stipulated that the common goal of the Allied forces is a demilitarized, non-aligned, united, neutral buffer state between the Soviet Union and Western Europe. Now, these shallow sort of friendly feelings of the Allies deteriorate pretty quickly. Um, and in March 46, Churchill delivers his Iron Curtain speech in which he contrasts that the liberties enjoyed by individual citizens throughout the British Empire with totalitarian control in Eastern Europe and warned that the communist fifth columns in the West constituted a peril to Christian civilization. I mean, just for a tiny bit of context, that is three years after the Bengal famine, when these free British citizens, or not citizens, whatever you want to call them, when five million of them die uh, in a, in a purposeful-induced uh, famine. So we need to consider that uh, in the back of our minds. Um, the leaders of the free world considered it very important to build a bulwark against the communist threat from the East. And in 1947, the coalition of the, with the Soviet Union comes officially to an end and instead is replaced by a narrative of a communist Russia prepare, uh, sorry, uh, with a narrative of an imminent war with communist Russia. In order to prevent this from happening, the second best choice is a cold war. So uh, the motto is roll back socialism at any cost. Of course, that cost easily contains a unified Germany. Um, what would later be called West Germany is being built with the help of the Marshall Plan, and West Germany is then welcomed into the diplomatic community of the Western countries and all its associations. UK and US unite their zones into a bi-zone, and then later it turns with France into a tri-zone. And I think we should rush through some dates to see um, the sort of what is action and what is reaction in this process. So. On June 20, 1948, in the West, a monetary reform is uh, introduced that like, immediately causes sort of threat of hyperinflation in the East. So they are forced to do the same. Three days later, uh, they do a, there's an answer to this, also a mon monetary reform. Again, lots of this can be found uh, in books, how they didn't actually have printed uh, banknotes or coins or anything ready because they weren't prepared uh, in the Soviet zone. Um, next, the... Marshall Plan recipients found the European Economic Cooperation. In a long process later on, this will turn into something like the European Union. Um, anyways, they unite their efforts. Shortly after that, uh, the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, or Comic-Con, is being founded uh, on the eastern side, together with other later socialist camps, countries. Um, Finally, or not finally, but ultimately on May 23rd, 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany is founded and with it, uh, its introduction, uh, with the introduction of Germany's basic law, which still rules today. Um, so that's West Germany is being founded. The answer is let's found East Germany uh, on October 7th. Um, it inaugurates its first constitution. We will later know, learn more about constitution processes because that's not its only constitution. Um, May 6, 1955, West Germany joins NATO. The answer, the Warsaw Contract as part of the uh, Eastern Bloc, um, well, military alliance. And then finally, 1955, the foundation of the Bundeswehr, which is the German, West German army called, or now the all German army. And in 56, the answer, the founding of the National People's Army. Now, I think we need to be really clear that, first of all, many of those things are against the Potsdam Agreement directly, like the remilitarization, et cetera, et cetera. We also should be aware that everything you see on the right side has disappeared with the fall of the wall, while everything on the left side is still 
to this day, the security or the, the, the system, including the security system that we are dealing with today. And I think we should be sure or we can be sure that it's always been it's always been the goal to create the most unfavorable conditions for any country that is trying to explore a non-capitalist um, path, basically. But let's get back to the four Ds and see how they were implemented. Denazification. Um, so there was the Nuremberg trials, which actually looked like denazification was a common effort by the Allied forces. But to be kind of clear, like a trial of 21 political, military, economic, influential people is a far cry from like upending the entire interlocking system, the relations of Nazis in all spheres of uh, the state, the economy, and public life. I don't want to go into it anymore, but I think for people who are interested in following people, like actually looking at individuals, I can recommend the Brown Book, which focuses exactly on uh, which individuals managed to escape any type of justice and ended up in high-level positions uh, in West Germany. Demilitarization and decentralization. Breaking up German industry was not just a moral imperative, it was also very much in the interest of the capitalist class uh, sitting on the other side of the Atlantic. But it also meant that the breaking up only went so far because despite strikes and demonstrations in the Western territories in favor of expropriation of warlords, in favor of um, also land reform, uh, the American and British occupiers intervened and stopped many of those initiatives. Uh, the heart of capitalism, private ownership model of production was sacrosanct. And in the end, those using slave labor and profiting from the war were very quickly rehabilitated and were then given the job of actually creating a defense against communism. Rheinmetall, I think, is an awesome example of that, if awesome is the correct word here. Uh, they were founded in 1889. They got into weapons and armament during World War I. Uh, in 1918, they had 48,000 employees. Then they take a short break and they build locomotives until 1921 and then produce for Hitler's war effort. In the Second World War, there's more than 80,000 employees, inclu including thousands of forced laborers. The tank you see here uh, is a tank they released in 1940. On the left side is Panther, the tank that they released in 1940. Uh, from 1945 to 1950, they take a short break again. Uh, they produce typewriters and useful things. And then in 1956, when the, as we learned earlier, when uh, shortly after the founding of the German armed forces, they become the official outfitter for the German uh, Bundeswehr, for the West German Bundeswehr. And the newest Rheinmetall tank uh, is also called Panther, and it is named after the tank that they developed for the Wehrmacht in the early 40s, which I think is a continuity that, like, it's pretty impressive. Um, though I did, I did talk to uh, someone about this situation, and I was told that there's a, um, if it wasn't so serious, I'll make the jokes anyways. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this Panther tank that they um, put out uh, in 1940 was actually so faulty and had so many errors in production that it could be argued that it supported the defeat of the Wehrmacht. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Of course, there are other companies that you probably have heard of, such as like IG Farben, ThyssenKrupp, etc., etc. Um, but again, if we think of the agreements themselves, and if we think of the four Ds and what that means, it's kind of, it's kind of impressive how far one could take it with a, with a different approach. Like if you, just because the US and its military is such a strong player in the world, if you allow yourself for a moment to imagine that you and your organization or the organization that you are about to found would actually be given the mandate to break up the US arms industry and expropriate all its assets and all its shareholders, I mean, that's kind of, a, that's kind of an awesome task. And so I think that this is where we need to look at what happened in the Soviet Union or in the Soviet occupied zone. Um, so internationally, there is a revolutionary wave building up after the Second World War. There's no revolution in Germany on the German territory and not in the GDR. Nonetheless, the GDR lays the foundation for socialism during what can be called the anti-fascist transition period. The Red Army occupying the Eastern Zone did not really intend to set Germany 
eastern part, the zone that they occupied, on a socialist course. Uh, remember, they wanted a neutral buffer state. They wanted to be out of it. The goal was to take reparations and address the issues in their own incredibly devastated country. In some way, the Potsdam Agreement does reflect the desire of the Soviet Union occupying force, and there has been quite a bit of speculation if this was just naive on their part to think that this was going to be something that the West would concur with. So the Soviet occupiers placed the building of the new state in the hands of German communists returning from exile, out of the concentration camps, and also emerging from, hi emerging from hiding. Many of them had already played a prominent role uh, in the in the. Uh, in, the in the German Communist Party before the war. And they used the vacuum created through the war and the delegitimization, the power vacuum created through the war and through the delegitimization and the dethroning sort of of the political class and of the economic class in all the occupied zones to their advantage. So how did they implement the four Ds in the eastern side? Um, there were two very important steps on the road to democratization of society. Number one, in fact, Nazi war criminals were removed from power. Their property and businesses, 10,000 altogether, were expropriated without compensation and came into public ownership. The, the uh, Nazi war criminals were convicted of crimes, of war crimes, and categorically excluded from taking on prominent roles and positions in the new state. Many of them also fled to the West, but again, we're not going to follow individuals through, um, through, the, through their yes. careers. Thank you. Um, the second part is the land reform, the land to the people that work it. Part of dismantling the fascist state structures concerned the big landlords. Landed nobility, they're called the Juncker. You can see that here. Um, their entanglement with the fascist state, especially in the military, and their support for Hitler had been significant. And also traditional land ownership relations were extremely, uh, like were almost feudal in nature in Germany. And they had been like a bastion for fascism. Land reform was therefore a super important moment for democratic restructuring of the country. Uh, estates also had very practical issues, like uh, combating hunger, etc. Uh, estates of more than 100 hectares and the property of war criminals were transferred into a land trust and already in 1945 more than half a million landless farmers and landless rural workers received the expropriated land as well as the refugees that came from formerly German zones back into the now new borders. Um, so this, this work also sh uh, strengthened the connection between, between workers and peasants uh, in the new, in the new times, closely related was an educational reform, which did not only aim to undo the sort of fascist propaganda of the last decades, but intended to upend and unlearn the entire history of the privilege of education for the elites. The approach was twofold, and included, yeah, and included two things. Number one. New teachers, a new teachers program which trained forty thousand young people who were anti-fascist, exiles, people just simply too young to be completely tainted by uh, Nazi propaganda, people prosecuted under the Nazi regime to become teachers in a very short time. The anti-fascist personality became a more important component of being put in front of a classroom of young people than the actual, I don't know, you have studied math for 20 years or something like that. So it was a learning process um, that was not relying on old experts for whatever reason. Second part um, is in Germany, education for the most part excluded working class kids and peasant children. Basic schooling, okay, but beyond that, uh, it was extremely, it was a very hierarchical system um, with no, with not very much mobility. Um, and this tradition was completely put upside down. One of the most obvious examples of this is the establishment of the worker and peasant faculty, Arbeiter und Bauernfakultät, which in the 12 years of its existence prepared 30,000 working class kids for university, or kids and youth, like often people who had not received any uh, proper schooling. And then there was some unfinished business. Members of the, socialist, uh, of the uh, SPD, of the Socialist Democratic Party of Germany, and of the Communist KPD, the Communist Party of Germany, after years of illegality in Nazi Germany, 
recognized that splitting the working class at the end of the First World War, which already happened a little bit before due to the betrayal uh, of the SPD and voting for credits, uh, for war credits in the First World War, but like splitting the, um, the working class in Germany during the rise of, during the years of Hitler's rise to power had been a huge mistake. Uh, and even now in the Western part, in the Western territories where the KPD, where the Communist Party of Germany organized and supported the striking workers that were, as we learned earlier, or as we heard earlier, were asking for expropriation and land reform, the SPD leadership often did not. So there was agreement in the East that the splitting of the working class needed to be overcome. Um, and in order to ensure peace and a common way forward, there had to be a unified party. So in 1946, the Socialist, Democratic, uh, the Socialist Party of Germany and the Communist Party of Germany formed the Socialist Uni Unity Party of Germany. All right, so little tiny recap. Uh, the starting conditions were pretty bad. It was a small country destroyed by war and a small area of a country destroyed by war. More, for example, more of a quarter of all the homes of the new state were destroyed. It was cut off from the industrial heartland of Germany. Most of the production and most of the resources were in the now Western territory. Um, there were no next to no natural resources. The population you deal with is, you know, in large numbers poisoned by Nazi propaganda. The Soviet Union is a reluctant, victorious occupying force that has nothing to offer, but instead actually pulls the reparations out of the region, which the West also in breach of the um, Potsdam Agreement, does not pay. Um, so all in all, 70% of the pre-war industrial capacity are no longer available in East Germany. By implementing the Potsdam Agreement to sort of the fullest possibility, the East German leadership and the people have opened up a path to socialist development in the country. Uh, what we see here on the picture is uh, the Third World Festival of Youth in 1951. I, we chose this picture because you can see that in the background there is still, you know, less. this is not being built up again yet. We are like talking still about a very destroyed place. Yet, uh, you know, thousands of young people from all over the world uh, come together and, well, plan and celebrate a peaceful future. And in following that, uh, in... Yeah, this is actually the Youth Congress was under the motto Peace and Against Nuclear War. Timely. Um, and this, of course, takes place yeah, in the destroyed city where actually also food rationing is still in place. So we are not, we are not out of the woods here at all. Um, and in, but at a party conference in 1952, so shortly thereafter, the Socialist Unity Party decides and sets out for the first time and says they will create a socialist society. So this only only happened, this actually only happens in 1952, that there's a determined effort or a dedication to socialism. Before that, everything else is anti-fascist transition period. All right, I think this is setting the stage, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe just to, to uh, okay, yeah, okay. right, you're right. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I guess we have some uh, space for uh, Q&A and discussions. And um, it is, uh, for us, was really important to start this whole session with this kind of uh, explaining the, the ground on which the GDR um, could grow, because we need to understand the very, the very much hostile situation that Eastern Germany is in. That you have this remilitarized uh, Western Germany that is actually still full of Nazi elites like, for example, the uh, one part of the Nazi intelligence service just got integrated in the newly found, uh, founded uh, Western intelligence service. And you have um, uh, a very um, confident West German state uh, fighting against the working class moving, fight, uh, movement, fighting against the unification of uh, the social democrats with the, with the communists. And uh, on the other hand, you do not have this kind of revolutionary movement in the East, that maybe we could uh, that we could, uh, could see in the October Revolution, for example, that actually also formed the um, their democratic uh, organs, units, to be actually the the structures of a of a new uh, new proletarian states. We did not have these kinds of things. We did have some anti-fascist committees after 1945, but it's 
it's uh, although there was um, opposition to Nazi Germany, it's, the resistance was pretty small. And this, we, need, we, we really need to understand this general situation to actually understand, okay, how could this socialist uh, society actually develop? Okay, uh, I think uh, we're very much uh, happy for any question, remarks, uh, discussions. Um, and um, yeah, go much deeper into, as we said, economic uh, system, democratic system tomorrow. Mm, but also, I think this is a good moment. If you look at the agenda, we are done with that. Um, maybe you want to say a few more words about the movie, because as far as for time, okay. that yeah. would be possible. Okay. And it might be, or do you want to questions first? I think people should know what the movie is like, and then maybe they... Okay, so want to make we choices. T totally uh, let this up uh, to you if you want to do this with us together. But we actually think the uh, well, the movie it's it's not made from the research uh, institute that we are from, but it's uh, from a communist organization, and they uh, did uh, a quite good job, as we think. Uh, it's a four series, four episode series uh, on the GDR, which uh, focuses on different fields of the society. The first episode that we wanted to watch is only uh, half an hour long. It's with English subtitles, it's in German, so we uh, think that's okay with you, maybe 30 minutes, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it focuses on uh, youth, education, and uh, yeah, children in the GDR, and it's a, a good addition to our program, as we think. And also it uh, um, yeah, stresses the founding uh, um, situation um, in Eastern Germany, and it lets some people speak that actually experienced this. So um, I think it could be a good contribution. But um, before we go into that, you can uh, decide whether you want to do that, uh, please. But questions and, questions and regardless, questions and comments. Comments. All right, if you can raise your hand if you have a question, and then also on the Zoom if you can raise your hand, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. I personally think the movie sounds like a great idea, and we have the time, so all right. I just wanted to say about the last picture that I've read and seen pictures about how the West German government tried to prevent people going from West Germany to the Youth Festival in Berlin, and they stopped yeah. trains and everything going there, and people had to practically run through detours to get to uh, East Berlin for that. Yeah, that's maybe uh, thanks, something thanks else. Thank also, you. Thanks very much for the presentation. I thought it was very good. Thank you. Um, I think that's something else that we, I didn't mention that at all. Um, we, we need to recognize that at this point, the borders are all open. So the comings and goings of from one to side to the other are not just positive. Like there's an, you know, there's like an incredible brain drain. There is an incredible, like there's acts of sabotage, et cetera, et cetera. There is like, um, yeah, so the borders are still open, which of course creates these issues that we talked about earlier, like the issue around monetary reform, when suddenly the entire East gets swamped with useless money. Uh, these types of things are, of course, incredibly simple because of the open borders. So yeah, sorry. Just on the note of um, East Germany uh, and, and the East in general wanting a uni united Germany and the West kind of rejecting it, there was um, a proposal made in March of 1952 for a uh, unified mm -hmm. Germany. It's called the March Note or the Stalin Note. And it was roundly rejected by the West German government yeah. and the Americans. Yes. Uh, yes, you had mentioned that you said it's no paradise. And um, I think, you know, we've certainly been fed so many lies and so many uh, distortions of uh, what life was or what the political situation was in, in um, the GDR. And I'm wondering, in what ways was it really no paradise? other than the lies we've been fed of everything in black and white and everybody online all the time and everyone's miserable and <laughs> those lies. So, yeah. Well, actually, I think uh, the introduction that Francisca gave is what we, we need to keep in mind. You cannot not understand the GDR without understanding this Second World War as a beginning. There was hunger, diseases that spread. There was houses, housing destroyed and so on. So it was a tough time, you know. It's uh, and uh, also the the work to rebuild a, 
uh, um, uh, a new the industry that was actually uh, before linked to the west uh, now need to needed to be rebuilt in the east again. So it was really tough, uh, tough labor and uh, tough times. Yeah, I think it was still uh, 1958 uh, yeah. that they still had um, food stamps also. That, so they uh, needed to organize the distribution of uh, food. Um, so in that way, I would say it was not a, a paradise. It was uh, a, a difficult situation um, and they needed to make the best out of it. Yeah. But, but I think I think your question goes further, right? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I I think. <laughs> no. I, I just wonder. Also, wait, until, wait a second. Up until yeah. up until the time of the fall of the wall, mm -hmm. it was still considered a miserable place to be, and I'm wondering. Well, I, we, I don't under, okay. I don't see mm -hmm. why it would be miserable to have. The, the housing and the employment and sure. education and all of this. I think what Max is trying to um, trying to emphasize is that it only gets to be evaluated if we see it from where they started out to how far they have come. Because what we need to what we need to look at, and I think maybe this is part of answering your question, um, in a in a society that tries to um, to improve the lives of the society continuously, but of the entire society that makes it a little, and also with serious constraints that certainly creates a situation where, I mean, we, I don't know, it was a joke when I showed the picture, but it is true that there was scarcity of certain things. Well, here everything is available, but not everyone can afford it. So um, was there a housing shortage in the East? Yes, there was a housing shortage in the East, but it wasn't a housing shortage because you couldn't put down a million dollars to buy something or something somewhere. There was a housing shortage because you just couldn't build any faster or there wasn't any, I don't know, there was no materials or whatever. So I think this is what sort of what, what Max was trying to describe by 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 sharing this moment of beginning. This is what we need to look at when we want to look at how far did the East come in 40 years? Did it look more gray? Yes, it looked more gray when people came from the West first. But, yeah, man, like in the West, you have advertisement to cover your horrible buildings. They didn't do that. So um, it's a very, so I think this is part of the complications that what was felt as, um, I wouldn't call it misery, but yes, I know that this is what it is uh, often named as, um, is just that the society developed slower because once you take the profit motive out of it and you lift up everyone at the same time, things moved, not because of that, but of the constraints around it, they moved slower. It was... Yeah, but, but uh, I, th I think it's uh, also important to, to uh, then again counter this, uh, this position because on a, in a certain degree you could maybe say it was a paradise in, in an understanding that actually the fundamental... Uh, needs the fundamental yeah. rights they were given and they were they were they were, they were on priority you know yeah. so if we if we are looking at um, social uh, problems that we face today related to these okay you can say yeah it was a social paradise but it, yeah we just want to want to set a, a right picture I guess yeah this is <laughs> wait wait a second Lian you we have to wait we can't just answer all the time. Okay, okay, so I'm going to, there's a couple people on Zoom and then I'm going to come back to the room because okay. I still see more hands here. So there's Renata. <laughs> yes, are you, are you calling on me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I spent a lot of time in East Germany uh, visiting old friends and doing research there because I, as I wrote in the chat, I'm a historian of Germany. Um, and I, I can tell you that I had so many conversations with people there. So on three issues that you bring up, travel, housing, and education, I could tell you quite a few things. First of all, on travel, that was their biggest, biggest complaint when I was there. You can come here, but I can go to your place. To which I would say things like, I thought that I understood that your children all go to the country in the summer. Is that true? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, the die Kinder müssen in aufs Land, you know, <laughs> absolutely. I said, well, there are children in my city. I'm in New York. 
who have never even been out of the city. You can't get out. It takes money to get out. So that was one kind of conversation I had. Then I had a conversation about housing. As it happens, one of the times I was there, I was sort of uh, going through a divorce and I met a woman who was also recently divorced and she was furious because yeah, she was divorced, but she was still, they, they were still stuck together in the apartment because she said, these people, you know, they have some idea of, you know, need. So families with children are uh, high on the priority and we don't have children. So we're lower on the priority to which I said, I'm actually right now in the process of divorce. And I, we have a six room apartment. This is the Upper West Side at the time we did have that, you know, <laughs> and I said, but there are people in my city who are 10 people in two rooms because they can't afford this kind of apartment. And then I had a conversation about education where in the GDR, they, they didn't have uh, self-service, right? You really had to sit at a table and be served. And sometimes you sit, sat with strangers, which could be a, a good opportunity to learn something new. So one time I was see, sitting with a young man who was a student and he was upset because he said, um, he didn't get what he wanted to do and because education was planned so that in fact they would have posts filled for needy for for for, for occupations that had to mm -hmm. be filled he said so you know they give us three choices and i gave them my three choices and i got my third choice and that's really upsetting so he still got a choice but it wasn't his first choice by the way, I ran that by a young friend of mine here, and he said, well, I wouldn't have liked that either. <laughs> but you know, it, this is what happens with planning, you know. Um, but I just want to put it out there, what I saw that I thought had a positive side, even when people complained. And by the way, they complained freely to me. Nobody was afraid of this, Dossie complaining to me at all. I just, you know, I heard a lot of, and it was like that. It was about daily life things. Nobody complained to me about being surveilled, interestingly. That was not something I heard. That doesn't mean it didn't exist. It means I didn't hear much. It wasn't like on the top of their complaint list. <laughs> oh, okay. One, one, one last story. So <laughs> thank you. So uh, one of the, uh, uh, the main archives, I would, this was actually my dissertation research way back in 63 and the wall had just gone up and the archive director had no end of talking to me. I actually asked to be moved to another room so I could do my work. Um, but, you know, at one point I said, well, you've got all these complaints, you know, so you were here before the wall went up. Why didn't you leave? You could have just gone over, you know, be, before the wall went up. And he said, oh, he said. That would have been like Robinson Crusoe going out into the wild. I mean, here I have my apartment and my wife has her job and I have my job and the child has the school and we have after school care and there's medical care. It gives me the whole socialist program <laughs> after having spent, you know, a good part of my research time complaining to me. So it tells you something about I hope it tells you something <laughs> about, uh, you know, how things how things were there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's great to hear. Uh, can I, yeah, you have a round of applause from the room here. <laughs> uh, can I see the hands in the room that we're still waiting? Uh, I'm wondering if the fact of the GDR, there's all of these economic rights that people had. Uh, impacted the way that Germany is now after reunification, if they were like kind of forced to improve the well-being of people in the West? That's a really good question. Uh, Wait, one second. Well, do, do, do we want to address it right away? Yeah, is that best? Or is it better to collect another question? Let's, let's collect questions, actually, and okay. then address okay. them together. I got to write it down. Oh, um, so you're saying the borders we're still very open, you know, until like 1952. Do we have an idea of um, just how much population transfer there was between the two and then how much population ended up before the borders really closed on each side, like the proportion of the post-war population? Uh, 
Hi, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was wonderful. Um, I've heard this argument made before. Um, it might be a bit of a radical take I've heard, but basically is that since GDR East Germany never legally ended, I've heard that argument that currently the half of the country is could, could be argued it's occupied by West Germany. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I just we go we go one by one, and maybe we. Uh, you can add up, I don't know. Okay, you can start. Okay. Sure. Uh, okay, so how did the social achievements uh, affect the living conditions in the West? There's actually, um, over the time of existence of the GDR, uh, the, it, the social conditions in the West were, on certain fields at least, so to say, okay, they were not... Uh, um, uh, yeah, questions as badly as they were after 1990. So uh, the, um, actually the West had to uh, implement some social improvements uh, also for the Western German working class uh, as, as concerning uh, uh, childcare or family uh, rights and, uh, and uh, well, the uh, level of uh, wages and so on. So uh, in that degree, definitely the uh, socialist alternative uh, had an uh, pressing a uh, pushing um, uh, role uh, to capitalism in the in the West. I think I would like to add to that that probably one of the fields where this was noticed most is around the equality of men and women. The idea of like women's, but during the time like that wasn't that is unfortunately not something that carried over quite the opposite. But um, the the during the time of the existence of the GDR or the entire socialist camp, the push for more equality for women was actually really strong. And there were some very clear um, gains made on the West German side for women or in the general Western side for women that are related to the fact that, well, if, you know, if the East is all a dictatorship, but as a woman in the West, you can't open a bank account unless your husband allows you to do so. Yo, like that's not really, you know, you can really see that this is not working out well. Or that uh, um, in the same, like, you know, in the end of in 89, there was 92% of women employed in the East, in the West. Again, you needed, I think that was changed also just in the 70s, that you needed at least the permission of your husband or your father to go to work, to get a job. And that was only okay if it didn't interfere with your wifely duties, whatever that means. So these types of things were actually quite they did make an impact and they did have an impact that in the East women's rights played such a different role and the equality was much more on economic independence was much uh, more pronounced. Um, unfortunately, after the wall fell, there was a lot of that that got dialed back very, very, very quickly. Women were the first ones unemployed. Suddenly all these kindergartens closed again because with a woman unemployed, who needs a kindergarten? They can just stay home and take care of stuff. Um, even the very... Um, the, even the abortion law was not, and maybe that leads to the question of annexation and occupation, even the abortion law that existed in East Germany was not um, adopted by the West, but instead Germany went back to the law that had existed since, I don't know, 100 years, like the communists pre-Second uh, pre World War had uh, demonstrated against this restrictive abortion law. So we went back to that. So we actually went backwards. And also, also the uh, uh, because your question also implied, what was the, is it still? Um, can you still see uh, the um, the existence of the GDR uh, today? Uh, in many ways, it is still uh, relevant and existing in the social realities that we have in Germany. One, for example, is that uh, the workers uh, in Germany, the level of wages is uh, generally lower in the East than it is in yep. the West. Uh, so for the same work they earn, they earn uh, less. Uh, but there's many more to to say about that. I think maybe we can also uh, get into that uh, rather to the end of the workshop because it also plays a relevant political role for struggles today. Because there's uh, also a different kind of consciousness that maybe actually relates to the question of being occupied. Because uh, um, from my perspective, also it is not wrong to call what has happened in 1990, an annexation process. 
so to say. And uh, uh, many East, East German citizens would also call it a process of colonization, actually, because um, besides the total dismantling of the um, uh, economic structure of East Germany uh, through privatization and then, well, uh, just dismantling it, um, it's uh, a process of Western elites sitting in every level of uh, uh, the society, economically, politically, socially. So um, they are really the Eastern, uh, the GDR citizens are really downgraded to second class citizens, so to say. And it actually is something they experience, um, yeah, on a, on a just uh, very close level. Um, so um, for them, it definitely feels like being occupied, so to say, they came from a situation where they had had the say in the state, in the state, to a situation where they actually don't don't count much. And um, yeah, but uh, as as uh, as you implied, uh, I would disagree with that being a, a something in a legal level or so. The Western Germany did uh, make this unification process. It's uh, it's. Um, one little chapter of the uh, Grundgesetz, which is the constitution of uh, uh, West Germany, uh, through which they actually did this kind of unification process, which also uh, gave them uh, the possibility to go around making a new constitution, because this was in the, I think also in the Potsdam Agreement or something. Yep. Uh, no, no, not there, but uh, somewhere there. Uh, actually implied that if they're is going to be a unification. There needed to be a new constitution, but they didn't do it because they did it through another charter or whatever paragraph in the Grundgesetz. About the numbers, I don't know. Well, there's actually some numbers uh, in our uh, issue that I um, don't know by heart right now. There is uh, especially like the uh, professional people that uh, uh, had of uh, higher education uh, that um, uh, were lured into the West uh, due to higher wages, like uh, uh, doctors and so on, um, that played an important role. But this is a, it's a complex situation because also there's lots of migrants actually coming to the East from uh, the whole uh, field of the Second World War, so to say, like uh, the Eastern uh, European countries, uh, uh, many uh, of them immigrated uh, to the East. There's also uh, lots of the progressive um, uh, uh, cultural elite that is in exile during the Second World War actually comes to the East also because they feel related to the socialist program that is set up there. So it is a complex and not so one-sided issue, but it is a, it, it is a, a problem and it is an um, like increasingly uh, pressing problem also for the GDR that they spend lots of money on the education uh, of their people that then get lured away to the West. And it was a specific instrument also in the West that we are uh, actually experiencing right now as in the imperialist system as well as brain drain that it's, uh, uh, it's the way they get their educated <laughs> workers. Okay, so I'm going to propose we do one flash final round of questions and then we do the film. How does that sound? Okay, cool. great. With the um, GDR being gone so long, what is the situation with young people in East Germany? How do they feel about um, socialism and the GDR? I mean, I was in Germany uh, at the end of last year, and a lot of older people, as you would expect, have this great love of the GDR because a lot of them are struggling. But, but the yeah. question is, what about young people? You, you need to go there, I guess. Yeah. Let's take a few. Sure. Yeah. Uh, there was one more here. And then after this second question, Nico online. Well, not really a question. It's more of a comment that you can't forget that the East Germans voted overwhelmingly to give up the GDR in 1990. I was living in West Berlin at the time. And I, I'm not anti-GDR at all. I had friends in East Berlin I visited all the time. And I thought it was... A, a really fascinating place. But, at, and there was a very short time between the ouster of Hanukkah, I think, and 
that big rally on November 4th on Alexanderplatz and the beginning of 1990 when they could have gone their own way. And I thought they, I was hoping they would. But they voted overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly to, to throw this all away. So that can't be overlooked either, right? You can answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Nico. There we go. Uh, thank you so much for doing this presentation. I've actually been looking forward to it since I saw it was announced. So you're like the highlight of my week. So thank oh you God. so much. Um, thank you. But I just one is a, just a comment and the, then the other is a question. Uh, the first is just how LGBT people were treated in uh, the German Democratic Republic. Uh, and I have a quote from the East German Supreme Court. Homosexuality, just like heterosexuality, represents a variant of sexual behavior. Homosexual people do therefore not stand outside socialist society, and the civil rights are warranted to them exactly as all other citizens. And then I actually have a little screenshot that I share with a lot of my friends of an article called uh, Will German Reunification Hurt Transsexual Rights? And I'm not sure when it was written, but the person says, uh, as of now in East Germany, um, men and women 18 years and older have been able to receive government sponsored sex reassignment surgery, get married and adopt children. Um, and as a trans person, as a gay person, that's amazing. That was one of the biggest things that drew me towards wanting to learn the truth behind the GDR. Um, and then my only question is uh, the map you showed with all the segments showing the American, the French, the British, and then the Soviet territory. Uh, it's so interesting. And this may be a question because I don't know enough, but uh, why exactly was Berlin split up? Because it's in all of this Soviet area and it's just this little piece that you see in the corner of the map. And then kind of an aside, I see the little piece of uh, American in the British territory and I'm like, why is that there? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nico, for the questions. Amazing. Um, Go ahead. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Um, so the I want to take a moment and go a tiny bit in a roundabout way, answering the question about uh, the young people. Um, we just recently came across an article in uh, Der Spiegel, like one of the uh, more more important. Um, ma political magazines uh, in Germany um, and it uh, complained bitterly about the fact that children educated in Brandenburg, which is the country or the province that surrounds Berlin, um, don't know anything about the GDR. They don't know anything about the GDR. They don't know that it was a dictatorship. They don't know that people were in jail. They don't know that there was scarcity. All they know is what they heard from their parents and how much the teachers fail. And this is like a serious, this is a threat to the teachers in that territory. How much did the teachers fail to not educate the children on the GDR? Um, I have children. I send them to school. We spend at home a lot of time going through the way that German his, East German history is taught. And it's impressive in its uncomplexity. It works basically via checklists. One says dictatorship, one says not dictatorship. And then you get a whole bunch of questions that you can cross on here or there. And then in the end, it is a self-proven, I don't know, self-evident process of saying, da, this is the GDR and this is West Germany. So um, I think that the that young people in the uh, in Germany have a very difficult, and I think Max actually alluded to this, uh, have a very difficult time to relate to any of this. Because it is, it seems on the one hand, it seems perhaps not the most urgent political issue that they need to take up at the moment. And it's a hard work because you get shouted out and shouted down immediately. Like your teachers will tell you you're wrong. Uh, the television will tell you you're wrong. Certainly Twitter will tell you that, you know, you are, you are, um, most likely at the moment they will say that you are uh, a lover of Putin. That is actually the thing that is now, like these things go from one to the next so quickly, they escalate so quickly, that I think that um, 
for young people in Germany, no, it really isn't particularly the biggest issue to, to, to fight over. It's not their hill to die on to somehow defend the GDR. Um, on the other hand, we've seen this, we've seen this in the last 30 years. Um, when, when literature or like the, the, the first people who actually began to investigate the GDR from a, from a less uh, set delegitimizing standpoint came from outside the country. And this is the same, like this, this is what we just have to, this is just what we have to do and wait for, that there's other people who will say, hey, you know, like with all this aside, can you just look at this without, without all the, without all the hangups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we see this, I think this is what we're seeing now, that uh, just like the interest in socialism is something that has grown in the US in recent years, this is something that is happening in Germany as well. And it comes from elsewhere. It comes from international exchanges where suddenly people say, yo, like, I don't, I don't understand, like, the way you were telling about, talking about, like, if there's housing and education, what are you talking about? Like, we're all struggling. How can you, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this type of process is ongoing. And I think for German young people, it's, it's kind of a tricky, tricky task. And there's, it's not very homogeneous in, um, in how people relate to that. Okay. You want to take the next question? I guess uh, um, I'll, I'll try. Oh, comment. I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, comment on on your comment a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's a huge um, discussion that could evolve from it. First of all, I would say um, I would disagree that uh, actually the GDR population never voted on. Uh, ending the GDR. This kind of vote never happened. It's important to also be be precise on these things because what they did vote on was the Volkskammer, the People's Chamber, in March 1990, where then uh, the bourgeois uh, Christian Democratic uh, uh, Party got the majority vote. Um, but they never voted to end the GDR. And well, but, but, but I wanted to uh, say something before because you really ne you need to understand this kind of process that was going on. You had these kind of um, demonstrations, uh, especially uh, at the especially actually in eighty uh, nine. There were not so many demonstrations before. They uh, really de developed in a small um, uh, time scale, and uh, m most of the people that were going there were quite frustrated. Uh, on the uh, re re regard of uh, traveling rules, it was not very much uh, about in their in their minds uh, to end socialism. Actually, there's been uh, surveys that's been made in, in 1989, also in the GDR, that uh, questioned the people um, whether they want to end socialism or uh, whether they want to uh, 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 just reform socialism. And it was always a, a great majority that was saying they want to reform socialism. They don't want to end it. And uh, people were frustrated. There was a, a political crisis uh, going on, for sure, uh, for also many reasons that we will get uh, into more tomorrow. But uh, this whole process, this is really in this small uh, times, uh, time span from... Uh, uh, November um, to March. Well, yeah, October 89, so to say, to uh, the early on uh, 90s, it was, uh, you, you really need to understand the role of the West in this. You know, I just, I just want to give this kind of uh, framework, because uh, now when we see, um, uh, I don't know, color revolutions that are going on all around the world, we actually can see this kind of uh, thing that the West is doing um, uh, by especially using NGOs and their uh, all their um, um, uh, like media and so on to really drive this kind of protest and get a, get a get a lead in these protests and uh, move them in a certain direction and so on. And I would say that lots of these things are actually been practiced in this uh, um, uh, in the socialist countries in this time in Poland and also in in the GDR where they actually really did, did pretty much the same thing to get into some oppositional groups. And uh, the US was really far ahead also uh, of Western Germany, yet they had 
the specialists in 89 going in West Germany, like uh, Vernon Walters is uh, someone who's always been named a coup specialist from the US uh, elites, who's, who's right there and he's, he's know, he knows what he's doing and he knows what kind of critical uh, point he's in in history to really give it a last push uh, for socialism to fall. And it's not only the GDR, of course, we needed to talk about the situation in the whole socialist camp. It's not, it has a lot to do with the Soviet Union and with uh, uh, the reforms of Gorbachev and so on. But just to give you an idea that uh, from my perspective, the thing that happened in the, uh, in the GDR in 89 and the early 90s, it was a process that was out of the hand, out of the hands of the GDR citizens. But it was actually other, other peoples who got uh, who got the control of uh, what is happening there, and they have never been actually asked about what kind of future they want. And uh, many of them uh, uh, being involved in these uh, kind of protests also now uh, um, uh, now regret regrettably say, oh, okay, what have we lost? We have, now we can see what capitalism really is. We have learned it in school, but we have never really believed them or whatever. Uh, so there's also some kind of... Uh, yeah, ch change in uh, in understanding what what happened in um, from from these oppositional figures. Actually, just one last remark. I'll I'll stop there because it's it's a huge field. You can you can already see, and we could talk hours and hours about it. But it's interesting that leading figures of these oppositional groups that you had in the GDR that especially found their ground in churches uh, and in the so-called peace movement that developed. Some uh, like yeah. Uh, a bunch of these leading figures are now members of right-wing parties and right-wing organizations. So you actually also uh, uh, can can see, okay, what kind of characters uh, were actually leading these oppositional uh, groups. You know, this is uh, the peace was on their signs, but it was not in their actually goals. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop there. <laughs> Do should we address the last question briefly? Uh, oh, yeah, uh, sorry, about the LGBT uh, rights in the GDR. I'm not an expert on that. There's actually some interesting uh, articles that um, uh, uh, have been written about them, also actually by uh, uh, members of the um, security police, that, uh, at, at least I know one of them. There were laws that were uh, implemented, I think, in the 50s already, uh, so pretty early on, that... Uh, uh, legally normalized uh, sexually uh, uh, sexual orientations, but um, the culture at that had time still uh, still was did, did not caught up. Yeah. Um, as uh, uh, in in many uh, uh, yeah, that that's what what uh, I've learned at least about it. I'm not. Uh, but yeah. it is a question for us. That is a question to look at a little bit more closely because it also came up during our. Um, activities and presentations around the healthcare system like how did that actually play out and work so this is like for nico this is definitely something to look into but it is a fact that the the culture of uh at that time was also to some extent still very very traditional and so i'm sure that uh yeah people uh lg of the lgbtq community had at times also a very difficult time and so this is certainly not maybe maybe the laws were already in place but the culture certainly was not um yeah but that's something it, to it, look it, it also gives you an idea of how difficult it is to actually change traditional like uh, attitudes in, yeah. the, in the people and this is this is not something that can happen overnight but actually takes uh, also the like general functioning and the structures of the uh, society are in place, it really doesn't really change the mindset and characters of the people. But it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a long process. Okay. All right. Um. Thank you. Thank you for holding out that long with us. <laughs>